We will talk today about the epidemiology of specific viral outbreaks in hospital setting. There are three groups of viruses, including the major group respiratory viruses, but also bloodborne viruses and GIT viruses. For the respiratory virus, we will talk about SARS, which is SARS-CoV-1, and SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID, MERS-CoV, influenza, A and B, varicella zoster, measles, respiratory syncytial virus. For bloodborne, we'll talk about hepatitis B and C. For GIT, we'll talk about rotavirus and hepatitis A virus. So we will start with the first group, respiratory viruses. Uh, this photo uh, shows that uh, the family of coronavirus uh, include seven types of uh, viruses. The most important of them is uh, SARS-CoV-1, which uh, has been uh, almost eradicated in 2003, uh, caused uh, outbreak of SARS, and uh, MERS-CoV, uh, which uh, is known in Saudi Arabia and some other countries uh, starting from 2012, and uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID, uh, which has uh, been a pandemic for the last few years. Uh, each one of these has a natural host, usually bats uh, or mice, and some of them have intermediate hosts, like in MERS, there is camel. Uh, they are not sure about uh, COVID. Uh, there is a type of uh, uh, cat, uh, for uh, SARS-1, and it primarily affects the respiratory system, the three viruses primarily affect the respiratory system, but also affect other, um, other organs. So this is an introduction about a large family of coronavirus. We're interested only in the first three, as we said. So starting with the first one, SARS, or SARS-CoV-1, uh, this is an, uh, uh, one of the members of coronaviruses started to be detected in 2003, mainly in China. Majority of cases were in China. And uh, it was uh, then uh, transmitted to other countries, especially in North America, in Canada, and in other countries around the world. Uh, fortunately, this uh, pandemic has uh, stopped. Uh, quickly in 2003 after taking some measures um, uh, and the total number of cases around 8,000 uh, and 774 died which is probably 8% uh, death rate so the death rate was 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 really high but fortunately the pandemic stopped uh, um, uh, suddenly so this map shows that the majority of cases, uh, 5,000 of the 8,000, more than 5,000 of the 8,000 is in China and then transmitted to the countries around. But uh, the, the, the large number was seen also in Canada uh, and uh, in the United States due to ba uh, patients who travel from China. Uh, hospital outbreak at that time 2003 has been shown in several countries including china canada and other countries uh, the symptoms are more or less similar to covid so it has insidious onset of fever uh, myalgia malaise headache and after one week we will start see the respiratory symptoms like dry cough and dyspnea uh, some patients have diarrhea 10 to 20 percent. Uh, the upper respiratory symptoms were not common, uh, like running nose and sore throat. Uh, about 10 to 20 percent of this patient develop severe pulmonary disease and maybe even respiratory failure, and 8 percent die. So the diagnosis will depend on the signs and symptoms, the epidemiologic link, the exposure, the history of exposure uh, to case the schist x-ray finding showing 
peripheral lower zone opacification of pneumonia uh, and also confirm it only with the lab test detection of diagnostic level of serum antibody is not very accurate isolation of SARS uh, virus uh, or detection of SARS nucleic acid using PCR and uh, this is probably the, the most useful uh, test mode of transmission is a droplet transmission so it's not an airborne transmission unless you are doing aerosol generating procedure for the patient so regularly it's a droplet transmission as well as uh, contact with the respiratory secretion and other secretions of the patients so direct contact with these secretions may also uh, transmit the disease but the major uh, transmission was uh, dro uh, droplet transmission the incubation period is shorter almost a half of the uh, uh, COVID so it is two to seven days and um, two to seven days but can be up to uh, 10 days uh, in, in, in COVID and uh, MERS-CoV it is double so it's two to 14 days Period of infectivity, roughly, you can say from the onset 10 days uh, uh, and after resolution of fever. So for the prevention and control, uh, it needs uh, uh, several hospital measures directed toward respiratory uh, transmission or droplet and airborne transmission. Uh, uh, so you have to place cases under airborne and contact uh, precautions. Uh, yes, it is droplet, but because at that time there was uh, like uh, panic around the world, so they were placing the patient under the most strict uh, condition, which is airborne and contact precautions. Uh, staff should wear uh, accordingly. The staff should wear the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment, including eye protection, footwear, uh, and uh, uh, mask. Uh, clean and disinfect surfaces because as we said, it can be transmitted uh, by uh, touching the patient's secretion, especially respiratory secretion. Uh, the bromide detection of cases and uh, contact tracing uh, and uh, doing surveillance among healthcare workers is a very important one. Uh, quarantine for suspected cases for 10 days. Uh, other uh, outside the hospital, uh, there, we, uh, there was also uh, home isolation for mild cases uh, for uh, 10 days um, uh, to prevent exposure to other people. At that time, there was no vaccine uh, for SARS. The next virus is COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 uh, is one of the members of uh, coronaviruses. Uh, it was discovered in Wuhan, China, uh, December 2019, and since then it spread around the world, uh, and it caused one of the largest uh, pandemic ever known in human history. This is the epidemic curve uh, of uh, the whole world, uh, starting from uh, January uh, 2020 up to March 2022. And as you see, there has been uh, waves and waves of uh, COVID-19, and generally it is increasing uh, in size across the world until uh, it decreased by the end of 2022. Uh, hospital outbreaks uh, are very common in, uh, in, in COVID and basically across the world, uh, producing severe uh, uh, out, uh, hospital outbreaks, large size that shake all the services in the hospital. The symptoms are very common start with fever, cough, tiredness, loss of taste, and later on, uh, 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 shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, and sometimes even uh, loss of speech, uh, mobility, and confusion. Uh, 
uh, least common symptoms are uh, uh, upper respiratory rhinorrhea, sore throat, headache, uh, aches, uh, pain, diarrhea, uh, skin discoloration, skin uh, rash, uh, and so on. Uh, this slide shows the symptoms that you may see in a patient with uh, COVID uh, and compare it uh, into uh, two versions of COVID, flu and cold. We will talk about these two types as you see uh, the most common uh, variants were Delta and Omicron. Uh, and the symptoms uh, uh, basically differ a lot between both. Uh, and as you see, upper respiratory, including uh, sneezing, for example, were common in Omicron, but were not common in the previous Delta uh, variant. Uh, on the other hand, uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, including uh, cough, for example, was less common in uh, Omicron compared to uh, Delta. And also uh, the loss of smell were less common in Omicron compared to Delta. So even the, uh, the prevalence of the symptoms differ according uh, to the variant of, the, um, uh, of COVID. So for the diagnosis, we have suspected and confirmed cases. Suspected cases, uh, any patient who have sudden onset of one of the following common symptoms, including fever, cough, shortness of breath. But also if the patient had less common uh, symptoms like headache, sore throat, rhinorrhea, nausea, and upper respiratory uh, uh, symptoms uh, in the last, uh, uh, in addition to uh, exposure to a patient uh, with COVID in the last 14 days. So this is also suspicion uh, of uh, uh, COVID. Uh, also any admitted adult patient with unexplained uh, severe respiratory infection, uh, then this patient also should be suspected as uh, COVID. Uh, but the confirmation is only by uh, confirming, lab confirming the diagnosis by PCR. Transmission is droplet transmission, and again, similar to SARS, it can be airborne transmission during uh, conducting aerosol generating procedure with some patients uh, due to uh, generating aerosol. Uh, and uh, uh, also, in addition to the droplet, which is the most common, uh, it can be transmitted by touching uh, contaminated surfaces and uh, uh, contaminated surfaces contaminated uh, with the respiratory secretion and other secretion of the uh, infected patients. Uh, this is slide show what is called R0. So what is R0? R0, um, like calculate for you the number, the expected number of uh, patients uh, of individuals that uh, can develop uh, disease when they exposed to a single patient with COVID uh, or any other disease. Uh, uh, when they are exposed and not protected, of course. So uh, in, in, in COVID, at the beginning, they thought between two and three, uh, especially Delta version, but uh, sorry, the, the, the earliest version. Then uh, within Delta version, uh, they discovered that the number is much higher, even double uh, seven people. So a single case can infect uh, seven people. And Omicron was even higher, they said more than 10. Uh, so um, giving you, uh, this give you the impression that a single case can infect many other cases if not protected. So unprotected exposure is highly risky in COVID. Period of infectivity, um, it depends on the type of patient. So the patient, if the patient have mild, moderate symptoms, period of infectivity is 10 days after the symptoms or 24 hours after resolution uh, of the fever. If the patient is asymptomatic 10 days from uh, testing uh, or blood, uh, sorry, specimen collection. Uh, if the patient is in ICU or had severe uh, uh, severe uh, infection or immunocompromised, uh, you should double this uh, amount, uh, this duration, 
into 20 days because they usually uh, expel the, the virus for or shed the virus uh, for longer time. Uh, for the prevention, uh, we uh, we see here in this slide 10 preventive measures. We will speak about them uh, one by one. Uh, let's first enumerate them. Early recognition and source control, application of standard precautions for all patients, contact and droplet uh, precaution for suspected uh, COVID, airborne precaution in some cases, management of exposure, pre precaution during transport of patients, administrative control, environmental and engineering control, precaution during collection, handling of laboratory specimen, environmental cleaning and disinfection after COVID infection. We will uh, describe more about these preventive uh, measures targeting COVID in the next few slides. So the first one, early recognition and source control. So uh, as long as you early detect the cases, uh, so you will be able to isolate them and prevent more exposure. So you encourage healthcare worker to have high level of clinical suspicion. So even gastrointestinal symptoms can be uh, COVID. So they have to be aware of different symptoms, even rare symptoms uh, that suspected to be COVID. Uh, activation of respiratory triage, which means that uh, patients coming to the hospital should be sorted and respiratory uh, uh, patient with respiratory symptoms should be placed in a separate uh, area. And signs uh, everywhere indicating, uh, uh, encouraging patient to report any respiratory symptoms uh, to the healthcare workers, uh, promote the respiratory hygiene, uh, masking, uh, so uh, patients in the waiting area should wear masking. Uh, respiratory hygiene means uh, they cough uh, uh, in, in tissues or, uh, on, or in their arm. Uh, suspected COVID patients should be placed again into a separated area from other uh, patients. The next one is application of a standard precaution for all patients, and this means uh, you see uh, universal masking in, uh, for everybody uh, on the hospital, healthcare workers, patients, visitors. And also healthcare workers should ensure wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment, including uh, gloves, gowns, and maybe eye mask in addition to the, the uh, eye uh, goggles in addition to the mask. Uh, do appropriate hand hygiene uh, after contact with the respiratory secretion and suspected or confirmed patients and ensure, ensure environmental cleaning and disinfection. Since the COVID uh, is transmitted mainly by droplet transmission, so you place the patient uh, under contact and droplet transmission contact because as we said, uh, it can be transmitted by touching respiratory secretions and other secretions of the patient. Uh, and droplet is the main uh, transmission. So placing patient in single room, ventilated room, uh, and if uh, not available, we can cohort multiple patients in the same room. Airborne in a special situation only uh, because as we said, COVID can be transmitted by airborne uh, while doing aerosol generating procedures. Uh, management of exposure, uh, patient sharing the same room uh, with confirmed case for at least 15 minutes, you should be considered these patients as exposed and uh, you need to monitor them uh, or to quarantine them, uh, whatever uh, uh, suitable according to the situation of the patient. Uh, precaution during transportation of patient, uh, the baseline, we don't want uh, other patient exposed to a suspected or confirmed patient with COVID during transportation. So you do all measures that prevent that exposure. For example, the patient should wear surgical mask, the uh, driver should wear also a surgical mask. Uh, the patient should be educated uh, for respiratory etiquette. Uh, you inform the receiving uh, clinic or, uh, or service before you transport uh, the patient, um, never trans uh, trans uh, transport uh, uh, confirmed case with suspected or non-COVID case on the same 
car if needed uh, if if, ne if you need car transmission then you don't place a covid patient with non covid patient or confirm it patient with suspected uh, patient and you make sure that the transmission uh, bed or transmission uh, uh, car be cleaned all the time several administrative controls uh, should be placed uh, as regulation within the hospital to minimize the spread uh, of the disease uh, so the first thing is you have good infection control uh, department the good infection control infrastructure and activities actually also training the staff about the good uh, uh, infection control practices is a major uh, administrative control uh, for COVID uh, transmission. Uh, policies on early recognition uh, of acute respiratory infection uh, in patients and healthcare worker. Uh, uh, the, uh, ensuring that we have lab uh, that uh, promptly uh, analyze sam uh, samples and give uh, results. Uh, prevention of overcrowding across the hospital so you may limit the number of people in some areas or most of the areas uh, provision of dedicated waiting areas for respiratory uh, patients with respiratory symptoms as we said uh, to ensure the triage provision and use of regular supplies and uh, we know that during a COVID outbreak in the hospital we will need more uh, personal protective equipments including masking and gloves. Uh, infection control policies and procedures uh, should be written and spread educated for all aspects of the hospital, all aspects of the all services of the hospital. Uh, so what to do in the ER, what to do in the surgical room, what, what to do in every service in the hospital. This should be uh, written and spread to the healthcare workers and also there should be a surveillance for monitoring healthy core workers separately uh, from the patient to ensure that suspected healthy care worker uh, should be assessed or uh, sent home according uh, to the regulation. Environmental and engineering control. So we need the, the basic health care facility infrastructure to be ensured. Uh, adequate ventilation, uh, adequate cleaning, uh, terminal room cleaning uh, after the patient discharge or transfer, uh, physical separation of uh, different patients on the, kept on the same ward uh, by, by 1.5 to 2 meters, which prevent uh, droplet infection uh, transmission. Precaution during collection and handling of uh, lab specimen. Uh, you should consider any lab specimen negative or positive. You should consider it as positive and potential source uh, for infection. Uh, healthcare worker who collect or transport the specimen should adhere to infection control uh, uh, practices and standard precautions, hand hygiene, considering all uh, specimen as uh, infectious, wearing mask and other uh, personal protective equipments. Uh, and in some times during collection of uh, aerosol generating uh, uh, procedure, uh, collection of samples during aerosol bro generating procedure, they should even wear N95 mask uh, or respirator. Uh, uh, and also, uh, they there should be a, a policy for spill decontamination uh, procedure if in case. Uh, happen like uh, uh, bad handling of a specimen or spills of a specimen, there should be a policy for cleaning and decontamination. So we uh, additionally, we should uh, place the specimen in double bagging. So for example, uh, the specimen should be placed in a bag and then in uh, another bag, so or another container, leak proof uh, container. Um, uh, also ensure lab is dealing with the uh, transported uh, specimen uh, using the appropriate biosafety uh, practices. Uh, if you can, better to deliver samples by hand. 
uh, do not use a pneumatic tube, which is a tube placed in some hospital to transfer the specimen quickly because we don't want this pneumatic tube to be contaminated uh, by uh, by uh, uh, contaminate, uh, contaminated specimen. And of course, with each transport, you have to have uh, HSN, uh, HESN uh, printed uh, lab requisition. So we know the name of the patient, the time of a specimen collection, and other information relevant to the lab uh, processing. In uh, environmental cleaning and disinfection, uh, so in patient rooms, there should be cleaned on a daily basis and uh, focus should be uh, directed toward high touch areas uh, and following aerosol producing uh, procedures, including uh, hard back chairs, door knobs, light switches, remote uh, handles, uh, desk, toilet sinks, and so on. Uh, also, uh, cleaning staff should be trained about the appropriate infection control practices, should wear uh, disposable gloves and masks all the time, uh, and should uh, uh, handle uh, the uh, waste appropriately. Uh, cleaning and disinfection should be done by approved uh, MOH disinfectant. Uh, these include hydrogen peroxide, uh, quaternary ammonium chloride, uh, fourth generation, freshly prepared sodium hypochlorite, 1,000 part per million. These are all acceptable. Uh, and after uh, patient transfer, terminal cleaning uh, should be done using manual method uh, and or ultraviolet germicidal uh, irradiation uh, or hydrogen peroxide, dry mist or vapor. So uh, this should be done after the patient discharge uh, or transfer or die. Uh, discontinuation of isolation, uh, you should uh, check the MOH guidelines for this. Uh, we copied for you here uh, two guidelines for uh, somebody who have mild to moderate symptoms and is not vaccinated on the left. You should uh, stop uh, 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 droplet and contact isolation after 10, 10 days from the symptoms, uh, ensuring that three days have passed without fever uh, and without taking any antibiotics and the clinical improvement of other symptoms like cough, not necessarily cough stop, but at least uh, improve. Uh, if the patient is asymptomatic, you wait for 10 days from testing date or uh, date of, uh, of specimen collection, uh, and then you stop uh, isolation. Uh, on the right side, uh, these are uh, patients who are fully vaccinated, and here we end self-isolation uh, self seven days after the onset of the symptoms or 24 hours after disappearance of fever without antibiotics. And for asymptomatic uh, vaccinated uh, patients, uh, seven days best since the, uh, the uh, specimen collection. So this may change over time, but uh, these are the current uh, situation for uh, discontinuing isolation. Vaccine, we have multiple vaccine uh, for uh, COVID, including mRNA vaccine, including Pfizer and Moderna, Vector uh, vaccine uh, like AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, uh, protein subunit vaccine as uh, Novavax. And this is photo for uh, different types of vaccine. The third coronavirus that will be discussed in this lecture is MERS-CoV. And uh, as, you saw it, as you see, it's corona uh, shaped means corona means like uh, rays of the sun. Uh, so these are the spikes. It's, uh, uh, it's the spikes, and this is the uh, N spike, uh, N protein, uh, nucleo uh, uh, capside N protein. Uh, this is the uh, envelope, uh, and so on. So it is very similar to uh, COVID, uh, and it started in 2012 in Saudi Arabia. So it was called Middle Eastern Respiratory Coronavirus, uh, and it first started in 2012 in Saudi Arabia, then it spread to other countries, but remained 80% of the cases in Saudi Arabia and 
in uh, in a large a lot, a smaller number in UAE and other nearby countries, but also spread to 27 countries around the world. Um, hospital outbreaks uh, was uh, uh, documented, and uh, again, it is similar to uh, to hospital outbreak of COVID. Uh, it devastates uh, the services in the hospital and may end up uh, closing the hospital to end the outbreak. This slide shows the diagram of OMOH uh, uh, enumerating the number of cases in uh, Saudi Arabia and how many died, how many uh, survived, and how many are still active in the hospital, and give you also the outbreaks. Uh, and as you see, we had a uh, big, uh, big outbreak in 2014, uh, and uh, this was including the National Guard uh, hospital in, in, in Riyadh. Uh, and uh, this is a very uh, nice statistics that keep the uh, public and healthcare worker informed about the severity and the burden of the disease. Another graph or, or map showing that the majority of cases uh, was in Saudi Arabia. A number of cases uh, in uh, South Korea uh, and outbreak, a large outbreak was discovered in South Korea uh, for a patient who uh, traveled from Bahrain to uh, South Korea. So the symptoms and clinical picture, uh, very close to COVID. So you have fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, body aches, running nose, sore throat. Uh, sometimes in uh, people with immunocompromised uh, diseases or situations, uh, the, uh, the, the, the symptoms and clinical picture become more severe. Uh, how you suspect a patient with pneumonia or RDS uh, admitted to the hospital, unexplained deter deterioration of a chronic patient who have congestive heart failure or on dialysis, uh, acute febrile illness with or without respiratory symptoms, and uh, interestingly, also GIT symptoms like diarrhea, colic, uh, vomiting. Uh, when this is uh, associated with leukopenia or thrombocytopenia. So if the ER physician find any of these symptoms, he should suspect uh, MERS-CoV and should test for MERS-CoV. So the diagnosis of suspected and confirmed cases, uh, for suspected, uh, uh, the patient should have one of the four criteria described in the previous slide. And in addition, uh, they have a history of contact with a confirmed case within the last two weeks. Confirmed case means it's BCR positive, lab confirmed, and mode of transmission, we have a couple of transmission here. We have human to human transmission, and this is mainly droplet the transmission and sometimes uh, contact with patient uh, secretions and staff stuff uh, and in uh, non-human transmission is when we have a history of exposure to camels in the last 14 days uh, because the disease is uh, almost endemic in camels and can be transmitted sometimes to people who are taking care of these camels so this is slide showing that there is two circles of the disease circles uh, of uh, with the animal. So uh, uh, dromary uh, reservoir is the animal camel here can be transmitted to human, uh, and there is a human circle where the patient can transmit the disease to uh, household, uh, community, and healthcare setting. And this is an example of uh, the transmission of patients in uh, National Guard outbreak in 2015. And uh, as you see, this red patients represent the patient who came from the community with uh, MERS-CoV. And they infect other patients, the first uh, blue color, dark blue, and then patient infect the, uh, the third layer which is light blue, and so on, until we had three patients in the fifth layer. And this is slide saying that 
uh, the trans the R zero of uh, R zero, which is the possibility of the uh, patient with mers cov to infect others, is less than one. That's why you see uh, this uh, waves become less and less after admission to the hospital. These were community patients. So after the red one were community patients, after admitted to the hospital, each layer decrease in size uh, from, uh, from transmission to transmission. And uh, later on, you will see the, the, the outbreak in by appropriate infection control uh, practices. So controlling MERS-CoV outbreak is much easier than COVID outbreak if appropriate infection control measures uh, were practiced. This is slide showing that the majority of patients were uh, in the ER. So uh, triage and early detection of cases is very important in uh, controlling uh, MERS-CoV uh, outbreak. This is slide again uh, saying that uh, this is a map of the hospital and uh, the red one is the community cases and as you see the main uh, area of uh, concentrated cases were in the er so uh, after this outbreak they did uh, several uh, structural uh, changes or modification in the er to prevent uh, contact between different uh, sections as well as uh, early detection of cases uh, and um, triage. Uh, incubation period 2 to 14 days, uh, maybe the median is 6 days. Uh, period of infectivity uh, can extend up to 10 days after fever. So for prevention and control, it's very similar to COVID and um, SARS. Uh, suspected or confirmed patient uh, should be placed in a single room under uh, standard contact and droplet precautions because uh, it can be transmitted through droplet and contact precaution. But in some uh, critically ill cases, especially uh, in ICU, you need to make sure air, airborne precautions also uh, are um, are practiced, uh, so you have a negative pressure room or adequately ventilated single room with HIPAA uh, filter. Uh, staff should be wearing uh, appropriate PPE uh, for droplet transmission like surgical mask, gown, eye uh, protection, and goggles, uh, so and, go and gloves. Uh, but in case of airborne uh, precaution, they need to replace the surgical mask with nine uh, N95 uh, mask. Uh, uh, symptomatic contact should be managed or suspected as suspected uh, cases. There is home isolation also also to asymptomatic uh, cases, but there is no vaccine for uh, MERS-CoV. The next virus is influenza virus, and we know that there is uh, influenza A and influenza B that can affect human. Uh, influenza A has two types of um, antigens, uh, hemagglutinin and, uh, or H antigen uh, and nucleoprotein or N antigen. And uh, influenza A has several types, 18 different types of H antigen and 11 different types of N antigen. So any combination between H and N will give you new uh, strain of uh, um, uh, or new variant of influenza virus. Uh, influenza A, uh, there are many types. The most common is H1N1, H3N2, and H7N9. Uh, influenza B, uh, there is also subtypes, uh, including Washington, Focket, and Yamagata. Uh, for about every year, we have seasonal influenza happen and affect 5 to 10 percent of the population, and it can easily cause hospital outbreaks uh, affecting both patients and healthcare workers. Uh, influenza outbreaks are frequent with attack rate 12 to 60 percent. The transmission of influenza can happen, as, as we said, for patients and healthcare workers. 
and the number of affected people is probably larger than is detect than detected because of uh, the large number of asymptomatic cases. And if we look at this slide, we have different types of influenza, uh, H2N2, H3N8, and so on, H1N1. And uh, every now and then, a pandemic happen across the world. Uh, and the, the, the largest was in, uh, in 1918, uh, the Spanish influenza H1N1, and these uh, killed millions of people in, in uh, across the world, especially in Europe. Uh, the last H1N1 happened in 2009 and was very mild pandemic, uh, even uh, have mortality even less than the seasonal influenza. This is a photo from 1918 flu pandemic, H1N1, Spanish influenza, uh, that uh, devastated the healthcare system. Uh, at that time, there was no vaccine, uh, no um, um, technology to prevent uh, the disease, uh, plus the large influx of patients, uh, they opened the stadium uh, for uh, an auditorium for uh, receiving the patients. The symptom of influenza can be mild or severe. Mild is uh, flu-like symptoms, a fever, running nose, sore throat, muscle pain, headache, cough, uh, and tiredness. Uh, typically, uh, these symptoms disappear within a week. Sometimes there is gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea and vomiting, especially in the children. But this may be a severe form when there is viral pneumonia, secondary bacterial pneumonia, uh, um, and uh, more complication for uh, lung and heart. Diagnosis by sign and symptoms or confirmation of the virus by PCR or other diagnostic tests. Uh, influenza is transmitted from human to human through droplet uh, transmission. Uh, and also ingestion of uh, droplets uh, during coughing and sneezing. But also it can be transmitted from animal uh, to human, especially uh, bork influenza and bird influenza can be transmitted from borks and birds to human. Incubation period for, for influenza is very short, uh, so symptoms appear within one to seven days, usually two days after exposure to infected patient. Uh, period of infectivity, uh, uh, the patient become contagious one day before the onset of symptoms uh, until about a week after symptoms. Uh, severely ill patients can, uh, can still shed the virus for longer duration, uh, maybe a few weeks. For prevention, it is the same preventive measures uh, allocated for respiratory infection. Uh, and there is vaccination, fortunately. Uh, we can use it for patients and healthcare workers. Uh, the preventive measures include uh, respiratory hygiene, cough etiquette, triage, uh, cohorting the same uh, patients, uh, patient with the same diagnosis in the same room. Um, uh, management of patient flu, beds and care organization, so not to allow um, uh, patients to be exposed to respiratory uh, symptoms. Uh, droplet precautions uh, and extra caution when there is aerosol generating procedure. Uh, maybe there is airborne, but the, the main uh, way of, uh, of transmission is droplet transmission. That's why we need droplet uh, precaution. Proper environmental hygiene, cleaning, disinfection, restrict visitors, uh, uh, administrative change uh, to allow less uh, uh, exposure of patients, uh, training and education of healthcare uh, staff, uh, surveillance of nosocomial influenza, uh, and early warning uh, when the number of cases increase and vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. This is very important, although a lot of people do not like the vaccine.
The vaccine is four strains uh, together in the same vaccine, two influenza A and two influenza B. Influenza A used to be the most common one, H1N1 and H3N2, and it's given to healthcare workers, uh, extremes of age less than five years and above 65. Uh, uh, pregnancy can be given during pregnancy. Patient with predisposing lung disease like chronic lung disease, asthma, and COPD. Patients with chronic diseases like uh, cardiovascular disease, neuromuscular disease, cancer, and so on. Uh, patient in nursing home and old age. Uh, it, it is usually, uh, it can reduce the risk of infection between 40 and 60%, but it is different from year to year. Some years, 40%, some years, 60% or more. Uh, reduce ICU admission by 30 to 60%. And one of the main uh, job of uh, infection control practitioner is to uh, like propagate and promote uh, uh, influenza vaccine uh, among healthy care workers and patients. And they do campaigns for that. Thank you very much for listening to this long uh, lecture about different viral infection that can cause outbreak in hospital setting.